big question in entrepreneurship, the question on everybody's mind. Here we go. You ready? How bad is it to have a bag of classic backyard barbecue chips sitting around the office? It's not ideal. It's not ideal. A lot of people don't like that flavor of chip. And if you do, and I'm guilty of liking it, uh, they're kind of almost exclusively reserved for you. And that can be problematic. Hey, everybody, what is up? Joe Morrison, 49SAF Pod. Excited to come to you with a neat interview with two Alaskan entrepreneurs, Rick Nerland, Stephen Trimble, both of whom are 49SAF Advisory Committee members. So a couple things. One is this is a two-parter. We're going to talk about their individual businesses and the lessons they've learned in entrepreneurship on the first half of the cast. It's a little over a half hour. And then in the middle of September, and I'll get better about um, posting on the 1st and the 15th, but in the middle of September, we're going to come back and we're going to listen to their thoughts on the 49SAF and Alaska's entrepreneurial ecosystem. But first, today, we're going to hear from them about their stories, about their journeys, uh, some neat things. Rick spent 25 years at the Nerland Agency, and even though he spent 25 years there, he was thrilled when he left it. And he was happy that they rebranded themselves Spawn Ideas. Uh, Steve Trimble is going to talk about a couple of the hard lessons he's learned along the way in year one and year two of his operations. When we recorded this, he had one of the toughest days of his business life. But I'd submit to you, it was still a pretty good day for the guy. So anyway, without further ado, let's go to the 49 SAF pod. Rick Nerland and Steve Trimble, members of the 49 State Angel Fund Advisory Committee. Here we go. What I thought, <laughs> what I thought we'd do today, guys, is we'd just talk a little bit about the past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. So, um, just a kind of free-ranging conversation between the three of us. Um, everybody interjecting. The past is definitely Rick's entrepreneurial journey uh, and his his life cycle with the Nerland Agency. I see he's still wearing a, a really cool Nerland Agency. Sweater. I got lots of logo wear. I'm kind of short a couple sweaters <laughs> myself, man. Kind of funny. I'm wearing my logo wear. Oh, look at that. Today as well. And then I thought we'd yeah. go to you, Steve. <laughs> Although we're all going to talk at the same time to keep things interesting. Perfect. Keep our energy levels up. But we're going to go to you to talk about the present because you're like in year one or two of ASV. Yeah, second year. Okay. Yep. Second yep. year. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to try to use this as my podcasting studio after hours. That's that extra board contribution that you're going to make. Perfect. Okay. We'll get you a key. And then I thought what we do after we talk about your entrepreneurial journey and its life cycle, Rick, and Steve, where you are, I thought we'd talk a little bit about what you want to see from the 49 SAF in the future. Okay? All right. So... Uh, without further ado, let's get started. Everybody, Joe Morrison here, 49 SAF Pod, coming to you live, not from the eighth floor of City Hall and my offices, which have been turned a remarkable, vibrant pink and green. More on that later. Um, but we're at the offices of uh, Arctic Solar Ventures and proprietor uh, Stephen Trimble. Thanks, Joe. Really happy to have you here at the office. I'm excited to talk today. So, Rick, uh, tell us what you did today, man. Well, today I started off with a, uh, a conference call with one of the uh, funds that uh, is being supported by the 49th St. Angel Fund. Then I attended a lunch for the mentor group for the Launch Alaska program, and we talked about how our program was doing sort of mid midway and what improvements we'd like to see happen throughout the, the rest of the program. Okay. And then anything in the afternoon or just bocce ball? Um, no, we played bocce ball Monday, actually. So I, I, I got my, my fix on that. I ran around getting ready for our duck hunt and gathered up all the requisite stuff you need when you go out to a shack on stilts on the inlet. Right on. So Rick Nerland is um, a longtime original advisory committee member of the 49th State Angel Fund. Stephen Trimble is a newer member of the advisory committee of the 49th State Angel Fund, appointed in about when? Mm, 20, April 2016, I believe. April 2016. Mm -hmm. Okay. So back when you were in year one of your business. That's right. All right. Yeah. And... Uh, 
So we'll get to, at the end of this conversation, sort of where you see the, the, the venture capital function of the municipality going. But first, Rick, I think we'd like to hear kind of about how the Nerland Agency came about and you know how you kind of built and created uh, Alaska's most successful ad agency, uh, where that came from and what you thought was important along your journey. And I'm sure Steve and I are gonna ask you a bunch of questions. So just, just okay, take sure. it away. Um, well, I started my business career in our family business, and uh, after 10 years, I did about a four and a half year stint with the, uh, the Olympic Bid Committee. And during the course of that time, it was very exciting to try and bring the Winter Games to Anchorage. What I discovered is that if I worked as hard for myself as I did for all my other bosses, uh, I would probably do okay. And so when the Olympic bid ended, I took some time off and thought uh, long and hard about what I wanted to do. And uh, my background uh, was in business, of course, and um, I have a degree in anthropology. Uh, all of a sudden, advertising started to make a lot of sense. And so I joined uh, Rick Maestrom's advertising firm. And within 90 days, he offered to sell it to me. And so I bought that. And within a year, we bought our second agency. Um, ten years later, we bought uh, a third agency, and then eight years after that, we bought a digital agency. Uh, cobbled all those together, and I guess the significant difference is that I really wasn't uh, interested in doing a startup. Uh, I wanted to grow by acquisition, and uh, there's a number of reasons for that. One, uh, generally when you acquire a business, uh, there's an existing banking relationship. Uh, you don't have to build that from the ground up. Secondly, uh, there's often a, a, a good customer base or customer list or at least the potential you can grow it from. And so it, it facilitates the operation of the business uh, from day one. Yeah, I mean, there's this, it's interesting, there's this thesis floating around out there now that baby boomers are ready to move their businesses on to uh, both millennials and Generation X. I'm not sure that I see that in, in practice in the market, but that's a theory that people float out there. I think it's more than a theory. Okay. Um, you know, when people are uh, approaching 25, 30 or more years uh, working at a company, maybe a company they started, maybe a company they acquired, but uh, as they start looking at their at their exit strategy, um, the you know most often uh, they want to look at somebody acquiring it and taking them out. In my case. That really wasn't an option for any agency here in town because uh, the nature of the advertising business is you have to avoid conflicts. And so if you work for one oil company, it's quite likely that somebody else worked for another one and you'd, you'd lose one in the, in the merger. So I sold the company to our employees through an employee stock ownership program, and it's worked out great for everybody. Worked out great for me as an exit, and it's worked out great for them uh, as they've grown the company. Superb. So tell me about what you really wanted Nerland to be, because you, you did it for like 20 plus years? Yeah, 25 yeah. years. So what, was, what were the keys to your success, and what are you most proud of? Well, I think that first of all, um, the key to uh, success in, in that business is, are the people that walk through the door every morning and walk out at night. And so we tried very hard to take good care of the people that uh, were part of the agency's success. It's one of the reasons I really wanted to do a, a employee stock ownership program. Um, we tended the culture a lot. We got a lot of input from other agencies outside of this market through national associations and through networks. Um, it, you have to be, um, you, ha you have to be collaborative in that business. And so uh, I guess what I was most proud of was we were able to bring a number of innovations into this market, which ultimately uh, provided for success. I, I didn't start out wanting to be the biggest agency. I just wanted to have a real competitive edge and be the best agency uh, that, that we could be. Uh, but that's translated into um, pretty good size at this point. I'm going to force Trimble to ask you a question. Come on, Trimble, get in there, man. 
Um, it's been interesting thinking about uh, the, your story, um, Rick, right from the very beginning, because you, you mentioned you had gone to school for anthropology. Um, I went to school for geology and ended up doing solar uh, now. So it's, it's, I, I always find it interesting when you <clears throat> encounter someone that started off in the sciences and drifted into business because um, that's obviously something that's near and dear to me. But I, th I think it's a, I think it's a very successful recipe, um, well, which is really interesting. Coincidentally, uh, in the mid to late '90s, the advertising industry became enamored with cultural anthropology, and mm. uh, the 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 hot find was was a uh, recent. Uh, College graduate or uh, you know advanced degree graduate with an anthropology background that could interject uh, some of the elements of culture studies into your messaging and into yep. your market analysis, and so it actually um, came in very handy in my case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and, and it's interesting in that you know what I guess the other question that I have, Rick, is what is the what are you really proud of about Maryland? Well, I think, first of all, the, the, the body of work that the agency's done, and it's now, it's now Spawn Ideas, and they rebranded the agency as they should have. Uh, I was totally in favor of that. And uh, the body of work, the innovation, uh, going from an era where uh, I think we had uh, word processors, but no computers on anybody's desk, um, to <laughs> being totally digital now and uh, you know, doing a lot of work in the cloud. Um, you know, what I'm, I'm also really proud about is uh, training the leadership group uh, as I plan my exit. Uh, I got great advice from my board of directors that said the ownership part isn't difficult to manage, it's making sure that the right people are going to be there to run it. And so we spent a lot of time and energy uh, developing skills within our executive team. And seeing them be so successful is probably the biggest uh, accomplishment I have. Rick, several members of that team are still at Spawn. Yeah, isn't that right? Yes. Yeah, so that's that's pretty great. You know, uh, being the founder of a young company and seeing culture transition. You know, like very early on. You know, you, as the founder, you kind of drive the creation of that culture, and you have to cultivate it quite a bit. Um, and it's easy for it to go off the rails. Um, but it's really that's a really fantastic testament to see it carry on to sort of that you know, next next generation and see it still thriving today. It's amazing. You know, one of the things that I noticed, uh, so I was there today just coincidentally. I wanted to pop in and see what Spawn was up to because they are thought leaders in the space in Alaska. I think that's mm -hmm. undeniable. There is one startup operating out of Spawn called Hooligan Ideas. Or maybe it's not Hooligan Ideas, maybe it's just Hooligan. Hooligan. It's probably just Hooligan. I'm, yeah. Anyway, uh, and it's design thinking, and someday I'm going to ask them to sit me down for five weeks and explain to me exactly what design thinking is. Um, and they have another company underneath them that has helped them be vertically integrated into mm -hmm. the printing and sort of distribution process of their um, point of sale statements and product. So super cool, super smart, super wonderful group of people and you know clearly it's still kind of a market leader so congratulations rick oh thanks they yeah. they deserve a lot of the credit for the last you know 10 years um they, they really pushed hard to uh bring insight thinking into this market and like you said design thinking is is going to be a mainstream um activity in the future so the the tough question because you know why not how much do you miss it? Oh, I, I was ready to re to leave the agency. I, I had a great, the last year and a half I was there, I, I worked on a great project, and uh, uh, but I, I had this very well planned out, and uh, I was ready. I 
and love going by when they have a celebration of somebody's 20 year anniversary or something like that. But, uh, um, you know, I I'm, I'm, was just fine letting go and, and uh, spending time on stuff I like to do. Wow, that sounds fascinating. All right, so we're going to turn things over to the young buck in town, Steve Trimble. Uh, probably, okay. I, I would assume you're younger than me. I hope you are. I'm, Don't add, let's uh, not find out. Okay. Let's not find out. We can place bets later. I, I'm going to bet on you. Okay. I'm going to okay. bet on you. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, Steve, when you said you were going to get into this business, I was like, okay, that's different from what you've ever done. Yep. And yeah. there was an element of finance involved, and mm -hmm. there was solar, and I, I was like, whoa, you know, Solar City's not in Alaska, so I guess this could work. Right. So tell us, tell us about the origin of the, how did you get here, man? Yeah, yeah. Well, I remember the, the very day we had this conversation. We were in the boardroom, and uh, I was just there. I was working out of the boardroom at the time with um, doing uh, some, like, business strategy consulting um, out of work, working out of the boardroom and uh, I literally remember turning to you Joe and I'm like hey I think we can I think we can build a solar company here Joe in Alaska and and, and kind of I don't know, buddy. I don't know. <laughs> that's, a, that's investor skepticism. Was this, it's was this in December? <laughs> yeah, I think it was actually. So increasing the skepticism factor uh, at the time of year, um, and I, you know, so we sort of sat down and talked through it, and we had several follow-on conversations um, after that, and you know, really, we were completely starting from from ground zero, um, and it's you know, I think every. Everything in, in life that develops some kind of significant meaning, there's always these little flags and sprinkles that you, when you think back on them, you you know you you go, oh yeah, this probably triggered going down this path. So, um, <clears throat> you know, I had a few family members that had done um, solar up here on cabins and and. Um, <clears throat> homes and they kept, you know, one of, one of my, uh, so I have an uncle that lives out in the valley. They own the Agate Inn bed and breakfast and uh, it's between Palmer and Wasilla. A lot of solar. He would tell me, boy, I think there's a great opportunity to start a solar company here because um, I do all my own solar and it works so well. And I remember telling him, no, oh, that's not going to work in my, you know, maybe early 20, early mid 20s. That's not going to work. And so that was going on. I'm like, hmm, okay. Then I was doing my consulting thing for a couple of years, and um, I started to get into this interesting position where companies from outside of Alaska that wanted to come here and develop business but didn't know who to talk to or how we do what we do up here, uh, and they needed someone to help them navigate the, the pitfalls and, and grease the gears. And then that just kind of ended up being what I did most of. Um, one of those clients was a large international solar company that wanted to develop some solar projects with ANCs, Alaska Native Corporations up here. And uh, we s created a kind of a project team and I was the liaison between them and we started working through it and they just kind of fumbled their way through and, and uh, one day I said, there's gotta be a way we can, we can do this better. Um, you know, just kind of, taking the Alaskan spirit and converting it to, you know, let's, let's do it our way, but let's also um, do something a little different. So the first, the first thing is that I think, you know, a lot of, uh, there's always been a, a very frontier spirit in Alaska where it's like, we're, you know, we're Alaskans, we do things differently. Um, what I wanted to do was capture that, but also say, but we have this huge wealth of knowledge where things have, with how things are done other places. And we can adapt those to our environment to bring success to, to what we, you know, to what we do and to what we are as Alaskans. And so that was kind of the concept to, to get the company together. And literally it was after one of these meetings that didn't go very well. And I, I turned to you, Joe, and I was like, man, I think there's an opportunity here. And it was about a year of research mm -hmm. after that and just like nose in the book and studying everything as much as possible, getting, you know, into financial models and learning what was going on in the industry, which was 
undergoing exponential, ex massive explosion at that point. Um, I think now there's over 300,000 jo solar jobs in the United States, uh, more than the entire population of Anchorage. It's pretty astonishing. So it was like, how do we capture this, this wave that's happening globally and just get a little piece of it here? That was really the impetus for, for and then uh, of course things never work exactly like you plan. And so you have to be adaptable uh, and willing to embrace change along the way. And so, you know, that both good and bad. Well, what was your biggest, you know, I think the thing about early stage companies is there's so much that can kill them. There's less room for error at all times. Yep. And so different entrepreneurs approach this differently. Uh, some bring God's fire, some uh, are more controlled and laid back and very analytic. Uh, what was your big hurdle in your first two years? What was the big, mm -hmm. the big uh, item that you needed to defeat? Yeah, gosh, uh, can I have 10? You can have as many <laughs> as you want, man. <laughs> um, one of them was just learning how to manage a construction project without blowing it. Um, I mean, that's, that's a whole different world, you know? It's like if you get onto a job site and you lose 10 nuts and bolts uh, and they're not readily available and you have to go spend three hours to get them some other place, all of a sudden you made a huge mistake and you cost hundreds of dollars in that day. And it's like, whoa, wow, I had no idea something so small could cascade into something so meaningful. And so that was one thing. So it's like, okay, we really need to learn how to build stuff right without blowing it. Uh, <laughs> and then there's everything else that they don't teach you. Like you have to manage your cash flow. Um, you know, it's not a, just about how many contracts you have signed up. It's about how that money comes in and when it comes in, uh, which is really important. Um, and managing and knowing when to pay that money out to your subcontractors or vendors or whatever, and just kind of managing that process so you don't catch yourself with your hands open and no cash in the bank. Um, that was also a real interesting thing where we just had to kind of learn trial by far, fire, really. Um, you know, those are two that jump out right off the bat. Um, you know, other, other ones are just knowing when not to give up because <laughs> you just get, you know, you get, you get, you take a lot of licks and, uh, you just got to keep going. <laughs> oh, I think I'll come back to that, but you, you know, Steve, the, every business is the same. Um, <clears throat> I can remember early on, I was really fortunate to hire a great CFO, uh, Lisa King. And um, we looked at our uh, cash flow and, you know, it, it was the custom of clients to pay 30, 60, 90 days. And, uh, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. some people say, hey, that's normal. That, that really is a normal in our business. Um, so, I have this great story. Um, <laughs> a friend of mine was in the Rotary Club and he said, hey, our Rotary Club's selling roses for a fundraiser. Um, how many do you want? And I said, hold on a minute. And I called Lisa and I said, how many slow accounts are there? And she said, oh, you know, maybe 10. I said, great. Got back on the line. I said, I need a dozen roses and uh, a dozen packages of 12 roses, so 144 roses. So they delivered them. I took them back to the office and I said, send roses to the person that approves our uh, invoices. <laughs> and we did that for three years and sometimes she'd deliver them personally. It was a great way to get a person-to-person -person connection. Mm -hmm. And then, since she's hanging around these accounting offices and these different clients, um, she's noticing that uh, when they get an invoice, somebody sits at a, at a desktop and enters it into their accounting system. And they enter in a payment date. And if they don't have a payment date, then they leave it blank. 
So I said, what if we stamped every invoice with a red ink stamp that said pay by this date? So that when that accounting clerk enters their data to get the checks generated, they have a date to put in there. Because they're never going to read our contract and know that we expect payment within 10 days of, of invoicing. So we just put those 10 days on there. All of a sudden, checks started rolling in on time. <laughs> Love it, Rick. That's an awesome story. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, <laughs> let's, let's go to something else. Uh, your toughest day, OK? So your toughest day in the business, Rick, and then to you, Steve. Well, you know, you always have the possibility of losing a, a significant client. And one of the things I learned uh, in the advertising business, any, any service business, is that uh, you've got to maintain your client relationships. And the competitive nature of, of the industry was that you know, people were our competitors were always talking to our clients as well. Um, I think my hardest day was the first time we lost a client that was significant, and I knew that we'd end up having to um, having to do a reduction in force as a result of that. Uh, coincidentally, though, uh, another agency came on the market, and within three months, we'd replaced all the lost business from that client with. Uh, acquired clients from that acquisition. So that one turned out okay, but it was our day. Yeah, some, sometimes there are the best things that never happen to you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Steve, your toughest day. Yeah, this is interesting. Um, it's probably two, actually, and for different reasons. So we were doing a, a large commercial project in downtown Anchorage um, that had I'm going to try and not get technical. It had an older electrical service that we had to shut off when we were hooking in the solar wiring. Um, <clears throat> we had to have an electrician in like a full arc suit with like a welder mask. And he said, well, be warned, sometimes these don't come back on. And we said, what? <laughs> they, don't, they don't come back on? This is an office building. We'll, we'll be... Uh, tarred and feathered and, and thrown out into the streets if people start this is so this is 6 p.m. on December 20th last year and we got to have the power come on the next day so we're all in this building pitch dark the power's off we're, we're putting in a new breaker we're all waiting around everyone everyone from the office came we're all in the dark in the building with headlamps waiting and going oh my god we hope this comes on or we're probably done <laughs> like if you know if 100 people show up for work tomorrow and they can't work because of something we blew this is bad <laughs> so we're sitting there he shuts the power off okay you guys can come back out from around the corners now you know he pulls up his welder mask does his work. We're waiting there about an hour. It's about 7, 7.30 now. And he goes, okay, are we ready to switch this back on? Okay. Gets his suit back on, gets ready. And I'll never forget that moment where I was like, oh man, this is either going to be really great or really terrible. And then he flips the switch and it came back on just like that, um, which was great. I'm never going to forget that. Never going to forget it. And then um, the other one is actually today. What, what, what a heck of a day, Steve. Yeah, yeah. So um, we found out today that we've, we lost uh, an RFP for the biggest project we'd ever bid on. So, of course, been there, done that. very exciting, you know, oh, my God, this is going to be amazing. We can't wait. You know, this is going to help just give us a major shot in the arm. We're so excited. We put together a killer team and we found out we lost. And did you lose to an in-state or out-of-state bidder? In-state. Wow, I didn't I didn't even know you had competition. <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah. So was there a public project? Uh, it was a utility project. Okay. Yep. So yeah, it was pretty, you know, pretty interesting. So we're going, oh, you know, of course you have, 
You know, you spent all this work, you built a great team, you put a great proposal together, you know, you, you just, you, you poured your heart and soul into this thing. And, you know, you don't win every project. And so that's always a learning process for, for us. And it's, you know, the larger the project, the, the fresher the sting. However, you have five or six employees? Yeah, five, so six, six, six including myself. And you've always made payroll? That's correct. Yep. Okay, so. That says something. That says something <laughs> right had, there. You've had some good days. Let, let's talk about that losing a big RFP because yeah. it's an ad business that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, putting together a, a, a pitch and a presentation and, and a response to an RFP you know, takes a lot of energy. And there's two things that I learned. If we won, then the real work began. If we lost, we still had about 30% of the work to do on that. If it's a public entity, uh, you can ask. This is, goes out to everybody that RFPs mm -hmm. in the in the in the cast world here. Um, you have the right to see the scoring. Right. You can talk to the um, you can talk to the um, procurement officer. You can request to see the last contract. Uh, and you can probably even get that before you have to submit a response. Um, you can uh, interview the procurement officer. And basically what we learned is that if we ever lost uh, an RFP, we did a post-mortem. Mm -hmm. And we had two people that usually went and looked at not only the the scoring, but then also talked about you know what the strengths and weaknesses of the other proposers were. Right, and it really accelerates the learning curve. I know what I'm doing next week, Joe. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, it also <laughs> helps when you, yeah when you when you get into it and you understand. Mm -hmm. Usually, you can see why they made that choice. Right you can adjust your approach accordingly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But it gives you the it gives you the background that takes some of the sting away. Believe yeah. me, I felt that sting. Mm -hmm. I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. All right, so, so that's the first half of the cast. We've talked about your businesses, and we'll, we'll come back next week with the second half of the cast, and that's going to be your thoughts on the 49th State Angel Fund.